Hello everyone. I'm going to discuss input output systems and this is the chapter number 12 of the book Operating System Concepts. And here I'm going to describe the basics of input output hardware and then I will discuss the input output services provided by the operating system and we'll also explain how the operating system bridges the gap between the hardware interface and the application interface and finally I will be discussing the performance aspects of input output and the principles of operating system design that improve the performance of the input output alright so the topics that will be covered are the following so we'll start with the overview and then discuss input output hardware and then application input interface kernel input output subsystem transforming input output request to hardware operations streams and finally performance so at the end of this chapter you will be able to explore the structure of an operating systems input output subsystem discuss the principles and complexities of input output hardware and finally you will be able to explain the performance aspects of input output hardware and software okay so let's begin with the overview so the control of devices connected to the computer is a major concern of many designers of operating systems why because input output devices vary so widely in their function and speed for example the speed and the function of the mouse are different with a hard disk with a flash drive and a tape so varied methods are needed to control them and these methods form the input output subsystem of the kernel which separates the rest of the kernel from the complexities of managing input output devices input output device technology exhibits two conflicting trends on one hand we see increasing standardization of software and hardware interfaces and this trend helps us to incorporate improve device generations into existing computers and operating systems but on the other hand we also see an increasingly broad variety of input output devices and some new devices are so unlike previous devices that it is a challenge to incorporate them into our computers and operating systems and this challenge is met by a combination of hardware and software techniques the basic input output hardware elements such as the ports the buses and device controllers accommodate a wide variety of input output devices and to encapsulate the details and oddities of different devices the kernel of an operating system is structured to use device drivers modules and the device drivers present a uniform device access interface to the input output subsystem much as a system calls provide a standard interface between the application and the operating system computers operate a great many kinds of devices and most of the uh, most of them fit into the general categories of storage for example disks or tapes transmission devices such as the network connections Bluetooth and human interface devices such as the screen keyboard mouse audio in and audio out but despite the incredible variations of these input output devices we only need some few concepts to understand how these devices are attached 
and how the software can control the hardware. So a device communicates with a computer system by sending signals over a cable or even through the air. So the device communicates with the machine via a connection point or we call it a port for example a serial port and then a bus like the PCI bus used in most computers today they are a set of wires and they are defined by protocol standards no? that specifies a set of messages which are conveyed by patterns of electrical voltages applied to the wires with defined timings such as for example when device A has a cable that plugs into device B and device B has a cable that plugs into device C and device C plugs into a port on the computer so that arrangement is what we call a daisy chain so a daisy chain usually operates as a bus or we call it a shared direct access buses are used widely in computer architecture and vary in their signal methods speed throughput and connection methods so in this illustration we will see a typical PC bus structure where the common PC bus system bus connects the uh, processor memory to fast devices and an expansion bus or expansion bus interface connects relatively slow devices such as the keyboard and serial and the USB ports so in the lower left portion of the the figure you will see four discs that are connected together on a serial attached interface or we call it the SCSI and the bus are plugged into a an SAS controller which is the serially attached um, serial interfaces alright and then the, you will see here the PCIe bus which is a flexible bus that sends the data over one or more lanes so a lane can be composed of two signaling pairs one pair for receiving the data and the other one is used for transmitting and then the each lane can be composed of four wires and each lane is used as a full duplex byte stream that will be capable of transporting data packets in an 8-bit byte format simultaneously in both directions the PCIe or we call it now the PCI Express card or connector uh, commonly it uses 8 lanes which is de designated by times X for example alright so this PCIe links may contain not only 8x it can also contain 1 2 4 8 12 16 or 32 lanes no it it is signified by the uh, x prefix and it's used to to connect multiple um, multiple connections along the the different lanes of the architecture the PCIe bus architecture so a controller as we have seen from here is a collection of electronics that can operate a port it can also operate a bus or a device and a serial port controller is just a simple device controller and it's a single chip or portion of a chip in the computer that controls the signals on the wires of a serial port continuing we also have what we call a fiber channel uh, this is also a bus controller however this 
uh, fiber channel is not simple because the FC protocol or the fiber channel protocol is complex so it's sat is it is categorized as a complex controller and it's used in many uh, data centers rather than on personal computers we're in the 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 fiber channel controller is open implemented as a separate circuit board or a host bus adapter or we call it the HBA which is plugged into the computer or to the bus some devices have their own built-in controllers so if you look at a disk drive you will see a circuit board which is attached to one side and this board is the disk controller and it implements the disk side of the protocol for some kinds of connection such as SAS and SATA for instance it also has a microcode and a processor to do many tasks such as bad sector mapping, prefetching, buffering, and caching. Now the question is how does the processor gives command or give commands and data to a controller to accomplish an input-output transfer? The short answer is that the controller has one or more registers okay for data and control signals so the processor communicates with the controller by reading and writing bit patterns in these registers and one way in which this communication can happen is through the use of special input output instructions and this instruction specify the transfer of a byte or a word to an input output address so the input output uh, input output instruction triggers bus lines to select the proper device and to move bits into or out of a de uh, device register alternatively the device can support memory map input output and in this case the device control registers are mapped into the address space of the processor wherein the CPU executes input output request using the standard data transfer instructions to read and write the device control registers at their map locations in physical memory oh, so in the past personal computers used input output instructions to control some devices and memory map input output to control the register in the illustration here you will see the usual input output port addresses for personal computers as well as the graphic controller which has an input output uh, ports for basic control operations but the controller has a large memory map region to hold screen contents a thread sends output to the screen by writing data into the memory map uh, region and the controller generates the screen image uh, based on the contents of this memory and this technique is simple to use moreover writing millions of bytes to the graphics memory is faster than issuing millions of input output instructions therefore over time systems have moved toward memory map input output so today most input output is performed by device controllers using memory map input output and input output device control typically consists of four registers no? They are called the status register, the control register, data in register, and data out registers. The complete protocol for interaction between the host and controller can be intricate, but the basic handshaking notion is simple. And we'll try to explain handshaking with an example. Let's assume that two bits are used to coordinate 
the producer consumer relationship between the controller and the host so the controller indicates its state through the busy PC bit in the status register so we can recall that to set a bit it will mean to write a 1 into the bit and to clear a bit will mean to write a 0 into it so the controller sets the busy bit when it is busy working and clears the busy bit when it's ready to accept the next command the host sets the command ready bit when a command is available for the controller to execute for this example the host writes output through a port coordinating with the controller by handshaking which is or which are as follows first the host repeatedly reads the busy bit until that bit becomes clear right second the host sets the read or write bit in the command register and writes a byte into the data out register number three the host sets the command ready bit and number four when the controller notices that the command ready bit is set it sets the busy bit number five the controller reads the command register and sees the right command it reads the data out register to get the byte and thus the input output to the device so finally the controller clears the command register and sees the right command and clears the error bit into the status register to indicate that the device input output succeeded and clears the busy bit to indicate that it's finished so this loop is repeated for each byte so in step one the host is busy waiting or polling so that's the term polling comes in no? it's, it's it's in the loop reading the status uh, register over and over until the busy bit becomes clear so if the controller and device are fast this method is a reasonable one but if the wait may be long the host should probably switch to another task how then does the host know when the controller has become idle for some devices the host must service the device quickly or the data will be lost for example when data are streaming in on a serial port or from a keyboard the small buffer of on the controller will overflow and the data will be lost if the host waits too long before returning to read the bytes in many computer architectures three CPU instruction cycles are enough to pull a device that is the read a device register logical and to exact or extract a status bit and lastly to branch if not zero clearly the basic polling operation is enough but polling becomes inefficient when it's attempted repeatedly uh, which will find a device ready for a service while other useful CPU processing remain uh, undone in such instances it may be more efficient to arrange for the hardware controller to notify the CPU when the device becomes ready for service rather than to require the CPU to pull repeatedly for an input-output completion and the hardware mechanism that enables a device to notify the CPU is called an interrupt the basic interrupt mechanism works as follows first the CPU hardware has a wire called the interrupt request line that the CPU senses after executing every instruction so when the CPU detects that a controller has asserted a signal on the interrupt request line the CPU performs a state save and jumps to the interrupt handler routine and it jumps at a fixed address in the memory so the interrupt handler determines the cause of the interrupt and performs the necessary processing.
it also performs a state restore and executes a return from interrupt instruction to return the CPU to the execution state prior to the interrupt. So we can say that the device controller raises an interrupt by asserting a signal on the interrupt request line and the CPU catches the interrupt and dispatches it to the interrupt handler and the handler clears the interrupt by servicing the device so in the figure you will see a summary of the interrupt driven input output cycle in, in, in step one you can see that the device driver initiates the input output so it goes to the input output controller which in turn initiates the input output and then the input uh, ready output complete or error generates interrupt signal and then it will proceed to the CPU receiving the interrupt transfer control to interrupt handler so from the interrupt handler it processes the data and returns from the interrupt finally the CPU resumes processing of the interrupted tasks and then it will um, return back to step one okay so the CPU could also execute uh, could be executing checks for interrupts between the instructions in modern computer hardware these features are provided by the CPU and by the interrupt controller hardware and most CPUs have two interrupt request lines one is the non-maskable interrupt which is reserved for events such as unrecoverable uh, memory errors and the second interrupt line is the maskable which which means it can be turned off by the CPU before the execution of critical instruction sequences that must not be interrupted and the maskable interrupt is used by the device controllers to request services or service the interrupt mechanism is also used to handle a wide variety of exceptions such as for example dividing by zero or accessing a protected or non-existent memory address or attempting to execute a privileged instruction from the user mode and the events the trigger interrupts have a common property they are occurrences that induce the operating system to execute a an urgent self-contained routine sometimes it terminate the process or it can be a crash system due to a hardware error operating systems have other good uses for interrupts as well for example many operating systems use the interrupt mechanism for virtual memory paging so a page fault is an exception that raises an interrupt and the interrupt suspends the current process and jumps to the po uh, page fault handler in the kernel so this handler saves the state of the process and moves the process to the wait queue and then it performs page cache management schedules an input output operation to fetch the page and schedules another process to resume execution and then returns from the interrupt another example is found in the implementation of system calls so usually a program uses library calls to issue system calls and the library routines check the arguments given by the application it will build a data structure to convey the arguments to the kernel and then it will execute a special instruction called a software interrupt or trap and this instruction has an operand that identifies the desired kernel service so when a process executes the trap instruction the interrupt hardware uh, saves uh, 
the state of the user code, switches to the kernel mode, and dispatches to the kernel routine or thread that implements the requested service. So the trap is given a relatively low interrupt priority compared with those assigned to device interrupts. So executing a system call on behalf of an application is less urgent than servicing a device controller before its first in first out queue overflows and loses the data. The DMA or the direct memory access is a special purpose processor that is used to avoid burdening the main uh, CPU and it uses the PIO or the program input output by offloading the work of feeding data into a controller register one byte at a time. It also requires the DMA controller, so it's called the direct memory access controller, which uh, purpose is to bypass the CPU to transfer data directly between the input output device and the memory. So, other functions of the direct memory access is to make the operating system writes the DMA command block into the memory wherein the source and destination addresses are uh, used and given. It's also used for the read or write mode, the count of the bytes, and write location of command block to DMA controller. So that means to initiate a DMA transfer, the host writes a DMA command block into the memory and this block contains a pointer to the source of a transfer and a pointer to the destination of the transfer and a count of the number of bytes to be transferred. So the command block can be more complex including a list of sources and destination addresses that are not contiguous. And this scatter gather method allows multiple transfers to be executed via a single di uh, direct memory access command. So the CPU writes the address of this command block to the DMA controller and then goes on with the other work. So the DMA controller proceeds to operate the memory bus directly, placing the addresses on the bus to perform transfer without the help of the main CPU. A simple DMA controller is a standard component in all modern computers from smartphones to mainframes. Illustrated in this figure is the six steps process to perform the direct memory access transfer. For example, in this case, we can see in the first step a device driver is told to transfer drive to data so from drive to data it will need to transfer the data to the buffer at address X so the second one or the second step is that the device driver tells the drive controller to transfer this certain number of bytes to the buffer at address location X Third, the drive controller will now initiate the direct memory address transfer. The fourth one, the DMA controller will now transfer the bytes to the buffer X, increasing memory address and decreasing the C until C is zero or until the transfer is completed. So when C becomes zero or the transfer is complete, the DMA controller uh, interrupts the CPU to signal transfer completion. So this, these are all the overall steps uh, processed on how the DMA transfer is performed during the operation of DMA transfer. So in this section, we try to discuss structuring techniques and interfaces for the operating system that enable the input output devices to be treated in a standard uniform way so we will explain for instance how an application 
can open a file on a disk without knowing what kind of disk it is and how new disks and other devices can be added to a computer without disruption of the operating system. So like other complex software engineering problems, the approach here involves abstraction, encapsulation, and software layering. Specifically, we can abstract away the detailed differences in the input-output devices by identifying a few general kinds. So each general kind is accessed through a standardized set of functions. We call it interface. So the differences are encapsulated in kernel modules called device drivers okay, that internally are custom tailored to specific devices but that export one of the standard interfaces. So in the figure, we will see the illustration how the input-output uh, related portions of the kernel are structured in software layer so you can see here the kernel and then the kernel input output subsystem which they are all in the software part of the the layer and they are all related to the other portions of the kernel in the hardware part all right now we need to understand that all the devices vary in many dimensions such as the following the character stream or the block so a character stream device transfers the bytes one by one whereas a block device transfers a block of bytes as a unit the second one is the sequential or random access so a sequ sequential device transfers data in a fixed order determined by the device while the user of a random access device can instruct the device to seek to any of the available data storage location. Also, we have synchronous or asynchronous or both. So, asynchronous device performs data transfer with predictable response times in coordination with other aspects of the system, while an, an asynchronous device exhibits irregular or unpredictable response times not coordinated with other computer events we also have shareable or dedicated devices so a shareable device can be used concurrently by several processes or threads while a dedicated device cannot we also have terms such as the speed of operation so these devices speed range from a few bytes per second to a gigabytes per second we also have read write read only and write once which means some devices perform both input and output but others support only one data transfer direction and some allow data to be modified after the write but others can be written only once and are read only after okay so for the purposes of application access Many of these differences are hidden by the operating system and the devices are grouped into a few conventional types. The resulting styles of device access have been found to be useful and broadly applicable. Although the exact system calls may differ across operating systems and the device categories are fairly standard. The major access conventions include block input output and then we also have character stream input output memory map file access and network sockets so operating systems also provide special system calls to access um, a few additional devices such as time of the day clock and a timer However, some operating systems provide a set of system calls for graphical display, video, and audio devices.
Now, most operating systems also have an escape or backdoor that transparently passes arbitrary commands from an application to a device driver. And in Unix, this system call is called IOCTL or which means input output control. This is used to uh, enable an application to access any functionality that can be implemented by any driver. So without the need to invent a new system call. The IOCTL function has three arguments and the first is a device identifier that connects the application to the driver by referring to a hardware device managed by the driver. The second is an integer that selects one of the commands implemented in the driver. And the third is a pointer to an arbitrary data structure in memory that enables the application and driver to communicate any necessary control information or data. Now the device identifier in Unix and Linux is a tuple of major and minor device numbers. So the major number is the device type and the second is the instance of that device. So for example, consider this um, SSD devices on a system. If one issues a command percent ls minus l or dash l and then space slash dev sda and then asterisk then the following output will be resulted so it shows that 8 all right 8 is the major device number and the operating system uses the information to route input output request to the appropriate device driver the minor numbers 0 1 2 and 3 indicate the instance of the device allowing requests for input output to a device entry to select the exact device for the request now we have a term called block and character devices and the block drive or block device interface um, captures all the aspects necessary for accessing disk drives and other block oriented devices so the device is expected to understand commands such as read write but if it is a random access device it's also expected to have a seek command to specify which block to transfer next Applications normally access such device through a file system interface. So we can see that the read, write, and seek capture the essential behaviors of block storage devices so that applications are insulated from the low-level differences among those devices. The operating system itself, as well as special applications such as database management systems, um, may prefer to access a block device as a simple linear array of blocks and this mode of access is sometimes called raw input output so if the application performs its own buffering then using a file system would cause extra unneeded buffering likewise if an application provides its own locking of blocks of regions then any operating system locking services would be redundant at the least and contra uh, contradictory at the worst. So to avoid these conflicts, raw device access passes control of the devices directly to the application and it lets the operating system step out of the way. Unfortunately, no operating system services are performed on this device. A compromise that is becoming common is for the operating system to allow a mode of operation on a file that disables buffering and locking. So in the Unix world, 
this is called direct input output a keyboard is an example of a device that is accessed through a character stream interface so the basic system calls in this interface enable an application to get or put one character and on top of this interface libraries can be built that offer line at a time access with buffering and editing services for example when a user types a backspace the preceding character is removed from the input stream and this style of access is convenient for input devices such as keyboards mouse and modems that produce data for input spontaneously and that is at times that cannot necessarily be predicted by the application so this access style is also good for output devices such as printers and audio boards which naturally fit the concept of a linear stream of bytes now because the performance and addressing characteristics of uh, network input output differ significantly from those of the disk input output most operating systems provide a network input output interface that is different from the read write seek interface used for the disk one interface available in many operating systems including unix windows is what we call the socket interface so think of a wall socket for electricity any electrical appliance can be plugged in so by analogy the system calls in the socket interface enables an application to create a socket and then it connects a local socket to a remote address which plugs this application into a socket created by the other application and then to listen for any remote application to plug into the local socket and to send and receive packets over the connection okay so th that is what the socket interface does there are many other approaches to inter-process communication and network communication have been implemented for instance Windows provides one interface to the network interface card and a second interface to the network protocols and in Unix systems which has a long history as a proving ground for network technology we can find half duplex pipes uh, full duplex first in first outs full duplex streams uh, message queues and sockets now most computers have hardware clocks and timers that provide three basic functions number one it's used to give the current time to give the elapsed time and number three set a timer to trigger operation X at time T so these functions are used heavily by the operating system as well as by the time sensitive applications unfortunately the system calls the implement uh, these functions are not standardized across operating systems so the hardware to measure the elapsed time and to trigger operations is called a programmable interval timer so it can be set to wait a certain amount of time so definitely it is used for timings okay and it's used for periodic interrupts so it can be set to wait a certain amount of time and then generate an interrupt and it can be set to do this once or to repeat the process to generate periodic interrupts so the scheduler uses this mechanism to generate an interrupt that will preempt a process at the end of its time slice All right. now the disk input output subsystem uses it to invoke the periodic flashing of dirty cache buffers to disk and the network subsystem uses it to cancel operations that are proceeding too slowly because of network congestions or failures
the input control input output control on unix system covers adds aspects of input output such as clocks and timers now another aspect of the system call interface relates to the choice between blocking input output and non-blocking input output so when an application issues a blocking system call the execution of the calling thread is suspended so the thread is moved from the operating system's run queue to await queue so after the system call completes the thread is moved back to the run queue so it's easy to use and understand however it's insufficient for some needs for the non-blocking some user level processes uh, need non-blocking input output and one example is a user interface that receives a keyboard and mouse input while processing and displaying data on the screen another example is a video application that reads frames from a file on a disk while simultaneously decompressing and displaying the output on the display alright so basically the non-blocking input call returns as much as available it uses user interface some data are copied some data are buffered right, it's implemented by a multi-threading and it returns quickly with count of bytes read or written basically it uses the select function to find if the data is ready then it uses the the calls uh, function calls read or write functions to transfer an alternative to a non-blocking system call is an asynchronous system call so the this asynchronous call returns immediately without waiting for the input output to complete so the process runs while the input output executes however it's difficult to use and the input output subsystem signals the process when input and output are completed so in this illustration you will see the difference between the synchronous and the asynchronous which are the two input output methods mentioned earlier so the asynchronous as you can see the, uh, the asynchronous call returns immediately without waiting for the input output to complete now unlike this one if the thread is processed and a request process is um, uh, given so it will wait for the input output to finish and it will be executed at some future time but in asynchronous for example an asynchronous read call request a transfer that will be performed in its entirety it will complete at the particular time like this one okay so it doesn't need to wait for the synchronous but for the you know for the for the synchronous it has to wait for a particular time to finish the input output to complete now some operating systems provide another variation of input output via their application interfaces and vectored input output allows one system call to perform multiple input output operations involving multiple locations for example the unix uh, read v uh, read v system operations this system call accepts a, a vector of multiple buffers to read into or write from a particular vector to a destination and the same transfer could be caused by several individual invocation of system calls but this scatter gather method is better than multiple individual input output calls so definitely it decreases context switching and system call overhead and however some versions provide uh, atomicity so this um, 
some version of this scatter gather provide at uh, atomicity which means it assures that all the input output is done without interruption interruption and it avoids corruption of the data if other threads are also performing the input output involving those uh, buffers and when possible programmers make use of scatter gather input output features to increase the throughput and decrease the system overhead now the kernels provide many services related to input output and several services including scheduling buffering caching spooling device reservation and error handling are provided by the kernel input output subsystem and they are built on the hardware and device driver infrastructure so the input output subsystem is also responsible for protecting itself from errant processes and malicious users let's try to discuss one by one like for example the input output scheduling to schedule a set of input output requests it will mean to determine a good order in which to execute them and the order in which applications issue system calls is the best choice so basically scheduling is done by some input output request ordering via per device queue but some are uh, some uses the operating systems try fairness and some implement quality of services for example IP quality of services now buffering a buffer of course is a memory area that stores data being transferred between two devices or between a device and an application so a buffering is done for three reasons and one reason is to cope with this with the speed mismatch between the producer and the consumer of the data stream okay suppose for example that a file is being received via internet for storage on an SSD so the network speed may be a thousand times slower than the drive so a buffer is created in main memory to accumulate the bytes received from the network so when the entire buffer of the data has arrived the buffer can be written to the drive in a single operation and since the drive write is not instantaneous and the network interface still needs a place to store additional incoming data two buffers are used then after the network fills the first buffer the drive writes is requested so the network starts to fill the second buffer while the first buffer is written to storage so by the time the network has filled the second buffer the drive now write from the first one should have been completed so there is also what we call a double buffering where two copies of the data and that means it decouples the producer of the data from the consumer and it relax, uh, relaxes timing requirements between the two okay so the need for decoupling um, wherein um, we will see a figure so as you can see from the figure it lists the enormous differences in device uh, data transfer sizes and such disparities are very common in computer networking where buffers are widely for fragmentation and reassembly of messages so you can see from here these are the common PC and data center input output devices and their appropriate interface speeds so the fastest is the PCI Express generation 3 times 16 and the last is in the position is the keyboard okay so the third use of buffering is to support copy semantics for application input output and an example of uh, to clarify the meaning of copy semantics for example suppose that an application has a buffer data 
it wishes to write to this it calls the write system call providing a pointer to the buffer and an integer specifying the number of bytes to write so after the system call returns what happens if the application changes the contents of the buffer so with copy semantics the version of the data written to disk is guaranteed to be the version at the time of the application system calls so independent of any subsequent changes in the application's buffer and a simple way in which the operating system can guarantee copy semantics is for the write function call or system call to copy the application data into a kernel buffer before returning control to the application so uh, caching um, a cache is a region of past memory that hold copies of the the data and then the access to the cached copy is more efficient than the access to the original for instance the instructions of the currently running process are stored on disk cached in physical memory and copied again in the CPU secondary and primary caches so the difference between a buffer and a cache is that buffer may hold the only existing copy of a data item whereas a cache by definition it holds a copy on a faster storage of an item that resides elsewhere okay caching and buffering are distinct functions but sometimes a region of memory can be used for both purposes for instance to preserve copy semantics and to enable efficient scheduling of this input output the operating system uses buffers in the main memory to hold this uh, data and these buffers are also used as a cache to improve the input output efficiency for files that are shared by applications or that are being written and reread rapidly so when the kernel receives a file input output request the kernel first accesses the buffer cache to see whether that region of the file is already available in the main memory so if it's physical this input output can be avoided or deferred so the disk writes are accumulated in the buffer cache for several seconds so that large transfers are gathered to allow efficient write schedules for spooling and device re reservation so what do we mean by spooling a spool is a buffer also it's a type of buffer which holds the output for a device for example printer that cannot uh, accept interleave uh, data streams so although a printer can serve only one job at a time several applications may wish to print their output concurrently without having their output mixed together so the operating system solves this problem by intercepting all the output to the printer and each applications output is pulled to a separate secondary storage file and when an application finish printing all right the spooling system queues the corresponding spool file for output to the printer and the spooling system copies the queued spool files uh, to the printer one at a time but in some operating systems spooling is managed by a system daemon process and in others it's handled by an in kernel thread in either case the operating system provides a control interface that enables users and system administrators to display the queue remove unwanted jobs before those jobs print suspend printing while the printer is serviced and so on okay some devices such as tape drives and printers cannot usefully multiplex the input output request of multiple concurrent applications so spooling is one way of uh, operating systems uh, on how they can coordinate concurrent output but another way to deal with concurrent device is uh, to provide explicit 
uh, facilities for coordination. And some operating systems, including VMS, uh, provide support for exclusive device access by enabling a process to allocate an idle device and to deallocate that device when it's no longer needed. Now, we refer to a device reservation as something that provides exclu exclusive access to a device wherein the system calls is used for allocation and deallocation. However, we need to provide a me mechanism to watch out for certain deadlock situations. Now, sometimes errors are closely related to the issue of protection. So, a user process for example, may accidentally or purposely attempt to disrupt the normal operation of a system by attempting to issue illegal input-output instructions. So we can use various mechanisms to ensure that such disruptions cannot take place in the system. And to prevent users from performing illegal input-output, so we can define all input instructions to be privileged instructions. So what it does is that the users cannot issue input-output instructions directly. So they must do it through the operating system. And to do input-output, a user program executes a system call to request that the operating system perform input-output on its behalf. So the operating system executing in monitor mode, for example, checks that the request is valid and if it does, or if it is, it does the input-output requested. But if the operating system, uh, and then after that, the operating system turn or returns to the user. Now, the kernel needs to keep state information about the use of input-output components and it does so through a variety of in-kernel data structures such as open file table structure and the kernel uses many similar structures to track network connections, character device state or communications and other input-output activities. Now, some operating systems use object-oriented methods even more extensively. For instance, Windows uses a message passing implementation of uh, for input-output. Like for example, an input-output request is converted into a message that is sent through the kernel to the input output manager and then to the device driver each of which may change the message content for the output the message contains the data to be written for the input the message contains a buffer to receive the data and the message passing okay it's use which the un windows uses the message passing approach can add overhead by comparison with procedural technique that the use um, shared data structures, um, the Windows message passing simplifies the structure and design of the input output system, but it adds, uh, it also adds uh, flexibility. Right? The Unix systems provide a file system access to a variety of entities such as user files, raw devices, and the other spaces of the processes. Although each of these ent entities support a read operation, the semantics are different. For instance, um, if you, uh, to read a user file, the kernel needs to probe the buffer cache Okay, and then after probing the buffer cache, it does it before deciding whether to perform a disk input output. And to read a raw disk, the kernel needs to ensure that the request 
size is a multiple of the disk sector size and is aligned on a sector boundary. Now, to read a process image, it's merely necessary to copy the data from the memory. So, Unix encapsulate these differences within a uniform structure by using an object-oriented technique. So, this open file record that you can see from this illustration, it contains a dispatch table that holds pointers. So, these are the pointers to the appropriate routines. So, for example, these are the user process memory. So, from there, we have the file descriptors. And then we have the, these descriptors are found in the per process open file table. So, it holds the pointers to the appropriate routines depending on the type of file here. Alright? Operating systems play a role in power use. And therefore, heat generation and cooling are some of the things that the operating system can manage. So, in cloud computing environments, for example, processing loads can be adjusted by monitoring and management tools to evacuate all user processes from the system, idling those systems and powering them off until the load requires their use. So, the operating system could analyze the load and if sufficiently low, for example, and hardware enabled, it can also power up the components such as CPUs and external input-output devices. So, CPU cores can be suspended when the system load does not require them and resume when the load increases and more cores are needed to run the queue of the threads. And their state, of course, needs to be saved on suspend and restored on resume. So this feature is needed in servers because a data center full of servers can use vast amounts of electricity and disabling unneeded cores can decrease electricity and cooling needs. In mobile computing, power management becomes a high priority aspect of the operating system. So, minimizing the power use and therefore maximizing battery life can increase the usability of a device, especially the mobile devices. And it helps it compete with alternative devices. So, today's mobile devices offer the functionality of yesterday's high-end desktop. So, we can now see our old desktops. No? So, we can see those uh, differences. Right, so but the power, uh, although the the devices are powered by batteries, they are small enough to fit in our pocket. All right, so in order to provide a satisfactory battery life, some modern mobile operating systems are designed from the ground up with power management as a key feature. Okay. So, let's try to examine in detail three major features that enable the popular Android mobile system to maximize battery life, namely power collapse, component level power management, and wake locks. So, power collapse is an ability to put the device into a very deep sleep state. So, the device uses only marginally more power than if it were fully powered off, yet, still able to respond to external stimuli such as the user pressing a button at which time it quickly powers back on. So, power collapse is achieved by powering of many of the individual components within a device such as the screen, speakers, and input-output subsystem so that they can consume no more power. Okay? So, the operating system places the CPU into a deep sleep. Alright? So, it places the CPU in its lowest sleep state. And a modern ARM CPU might consume hundreds of milliwatts per core under typical load. 
yet only a handful of milliwatts in its lowest sleep state. So in such state, although the CPU is idle, it can receive an interrupt. It can wake up and it can resume its previous activity very quickly. Thus, an idle um, Android phone in your pocket uses very little power. But it can spring to life when it receives a phone call. Alright? So, now, the question is, how is Android able to turn off the individual components of a phone? How does it know when it's safe to power off the flash storage? And how does it know to do that before powering down the overall input-output subsystem? So the answer is, we call it the component level power management. Okay? In, in the component level power management, it understands the relationship between the components. Okay? So definitely, to be able to understand the relationship between components, the Android builds a device. It builds a device tree which represents the phone's physical device topology. Alright? For example, in such topology, a flash and a USB storage would be subnodes of the input-output subsystem, which is, for example, a subnode of the system bus, which in turn connects to the CPU. And to understand the usage, each component is associated with its device driver. So, the driver tracks whether the component is in use. For example, if there is an input-output pending to flash or if an application has an open reference to the audio subsystem. So, with this information, Android can manage the power of the phone's individual components. Alright? So, if a component is unused, for example, the system bus is turned off. And if all the components in the entire device tree are unused, the system may enter power collapse. So with these technologies, Android can aggressively manage its power consumption. But a final piece of the solution is missing. What is that? The ability for applications to temporarily um, prevent the system from entering a power collapse. For example, a user playing a game or watching a video or waiting for a web, web page to open. In all these cases, the application needs a way to keep the device awake, right? At least temporarily. So, wake clocks enable this functionality. Alright? So, applications now can acquire and release wake clocks as needed. So, when, while an application holds a wake clock, the kernel will prevent the system from entering power collapse. So, power collapse put a device into a very deep sleep. So, it's prevented using wake clocks. Okay? For example, while the Android market is updating an application, it will hold a wake lock to ensure that the system does not go to sleep until the update is complete. So once complete, the Android market will release the wake lock allowing the system to enter power collapse. So power management in general is based on device management which is more complicated than we have so far portrayed it. So at boot time, the firmware system um, analyzes the system hardware and creates a device tree in the RAM. And the kernel uses the device tree to load device drivers and manage the devices. Many additional activities pertaining to devices must be managed, including addition and subtraction of devices from a, ra a running system or a hot plug understanding and changing device states and power management. Now, modern systems nowadays 
uses general purpose computers or set of firmware code called advanced configuration and power interface or ACPI it's a firmware to manage the different aspects of the hardware so ACPI is an industry standard you can check it out at www.acpi.info and it has many features and it provides code that runs as a routine callable by the kernel for device discovery all right management error and power management so in summary the input output subsystem coordinates an extensive collection of services that are available to applications and to other parts of the kernel the input output subsystem supervises these procedures such as management of the namespace for files and devices access control to files and devices operation control for example a modem cannot seek file system space allocation device allocation buffering caching and spooling input output scheduling device status monitoring error handling and failure recovery device driver configuration and initialization and lastly power management and input devices so the upper levels of the input output subsystem access devices via the uniform interface provided by the device drivers so earlier we described the handshaking between a device driver and a device controller but we did not explain how the operating system connects an application request to a set of network wires or to a specific disk sector consider for example reading a file from a disk so the application refers to the data by a file name and within the disk or within a disk the file system maps from the file name through the file system directories to obtain the space allocation of the file for instance in MS-DOS for for fat allocation for fat allocation a relatively simple operating system and file system still used today as a common interchange format and the name maps to um, a number that indicates an entry in the file access table and that table entry tells which disk blocks are allocated to the file but in UNIX the name maps to an inode number and the corresponding inode contains the space allocation information but how is the connection made from the file name to the disk controller so the hardware port address or the memory map controller registers so one method is that used by MS-DOS for file allocation table as mentioned so the first part of the MS-DOS file name preceding the colon is a string that identifies a specific hardware device now this is the typical life cycle of a blocking read request in this figure you will see the life cycle of an input output request so in the first um, process the a process issues a blocking read right so this process issues a blocking read the first step it issues a blocking read system call to a file descriptor of a file that has been opened previously and then second the system call code in the kernel checks the parameters for correctness so in the case of the input if the data are already available in the buffer cache so the data are returned to the process and the input output request is completed right otherwise a physical input output must be performed wherein the process is removed from the run queue and is placed on the wait queue for the device and the input output request is scheduled so eventually the input output 
subsystem sends the request to the device driver. Okay? So, depending on the operating system, the request sent via a subroutine call or an in-kernel message. Next, the device driver allocates the kernel buffer space to receive the data and schedules the input output so eventually the driver sends commands to the device controller by writing um, into the device control registers the fifth one is the device controller will try to operate the device hardware to perform the data transfer Number six, the driver may poll. Okay? So, the driver may poll for status. Alright? And data. Or it may have set up a DMA transfer into the kernel memory. So, we can assume that the transfer is managed by a DMA controller, which generates uh, an interrupt when the transfer completes. So, the correct interrupt handler receives the interrupt Okay. It receives the interrupt via the interrupt vector table. It stores it into any uh, it stores any necessary data, and it signals the device driver and returns from the interrupt. Next, the device driver will receive the signal and determines which input output request has completed. And then it determines the request status and signals the kernel input output subsystem that the request has been completed. Next step is the kernel now will try to transfer the data or return the codes to the address space of the requesting process and moves the process from the wait queue back to the ready queue. Finally, moving the process to the ready queue unblocks the process. So, when the scheduler assigns the process to the CPU, the process resumes execution at the completion of the system call. So, this is the life cycle of an input-output request. In Unix system, especially the Unix System 5 and many subsequent um, Unix releases, it has an interesting mechanism and it's called the stream. And stream enables an application to assemble pipelines of driver code dynamically. So definitely a stream, by definition, is a full duplex connection between a device driver um, and user level processes. So it consists of a stream head that interfaces with the user um, process okay and a driver end that controls the device and zero or more stream all right these are modules okay between the stream head and the driver end and each of these components contains a pair of queues a read queue and a write queue. So message fuzzing is used to transfer the data between those queues. Alright? So here's an example of the stream structure. So the modules provide the functionality of stream processing and they are pushed. Okay? They are pushed onto a stream by use of the IOCTL or the input output control function system call so for example a process can open a USB device like a keyboard via stream and it can also push on a module to handle input editing and because messages are exchanged between queues in adjacent modules a queue in one module may overflow an adjacent queue and to prevent this from occurring a queue may support uh, flow control but without flow control a flow um, 
control buffers messages will not accept messages without sufficient buffer space and this process involves exchanges of control messages between queues in adjacent modules now in terms of performance input output is a major factor in system performance and it places heavy demands on the CPU to execute device driver code and to schedule processes fairly and efficiently as they block and unblock so the resulting context switches stress the CPU and its hardware cache input output also exposes any inefficiencies in the interrupt handling okay so the resulting context switches stress the CPU and its hardware caches okay so in addition input output loads down the memory bus during the data copies between controllers and physical memory and again during copies between kernel buffers and application data space so coping gracefully with all these demands is one of the major concerns of a computer architect all right now some systems use separate front-end processors for terminal input output to be able to reduce the interrupt burden on the main CPU for example a terminal concentrator can multiplex the traffic from hundreds of remote terminals into one port on a large computer an input channel input output channel is a dedicated uh, purpose CPU found in mainframes and in other high-end systems and the job of a channel is to offload input output work from the main CPU so the idea is that the channels keep the data flowing smoothly while the main CPU remains free to process the data and like the device controllers and DMA controllers found in smaller computers a channel can process more general and sophisticated programs so channels can be tuned for particular work workloads and we can employs, uh, employ several uh, principles so that we can improve the efficiency of the input output and these are the following number one we can reduce the number of context switches we can also reduce data copying okay so that means we can reduce the number of times the data must be copied in a memory while passing between the device and the application we can also reduce interrupts by using large transfers smart controllers and polling right so that means we can reduce the frequency of interrupts if busy waiting can be minimized also we can increase concurrency by using DMA knowledgeable controllers or channels so that we can offload simple data copying from the CPU we can also move processing primitives into the hardware to allow their operation in device controllers to be concurrent with CPU and bus operations and then we can balance memory subsystems bus and input output performance because an overload in any one area will cause idleness in others finally we can move user mode processes but instead use daemons to our kernel threads now over the time as with other aspects of computing input output devices have been increasing in the speed if we will compare the non-volatile memory devices they are now growing in popularity in the variety of devices available and the speed of the non-volatile memory devices varies from high to extraordinary so with next generation devices they are nearing the speed of the dynamic random access memory and these developments are increasing pressure on input output subsystems as well as operating system algorithms 
to take advantage of the read and write speeds now available. In this figure, you will see it shows the CPU and storage devices in two dimensions. And what are these dimensions? The capacity and the latency of input-output operations. Alright? Added to the figure, you will also see a representation of networking latency. Alright? To reveal the performance tax networking that adds to the input-output. Alright? So, I think uh, we are done. In this chapter, we, we discuss the basic uh, hardware elements involved in input-output buses. They are the device controllers and the device devices themselves. And we also take a look on the work of moving data between devices and main memory, which is performed by the CPU as programmed input-output is offloaded to a direct memory access or DMA controller. We also understood that the kernel module that controls a device is a device driver. And the system call interface provided to application is designed to handle several basic categories of the hardware. And it includes block devices, character stream devices, memory map files, network sockets, and program interval timers. So the system calls usually block the processes that issue them, but non-blocking and asynchronous calls are used by the kernel itself and by applications that must not sleep while waiting for an input-output operation to complete. The kernel's input-output subsystem provides numerous services, and among these are input-output scheduling. It also includes buffering, caching, spooling, device reservation, error handling. However, another service is called translation makes the connections between the hardware devices and the symbolic files names used by the application. Streams, as we have discussed, is an implementation and methodology that provides a framework for modular and incremental um, approach to writing device drivers and network protocols and through streams drivers can be stuck with data passing through them sequentially and bidirectionally for processing finally input system calls are costly in terms of cpu consumption because of the many layers of software between a physical device and an application and these layers imply overhead from several sources context switching to a to cross the kernel's protection boundary, signal and interrupt handling to service the input-output devices, and the load on the CPU and memory system to copy data between the kernel buffers and application space. Alright, that's, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.